Okay, welcome everybody in, uh, to this uh, third panel of this uh, amazingly interesting uh, conference. I want to thank Marla Stone for having included me in, uh, in a conference very far from my field. I'm an early modern historian but that I've found so far extremely interesting and fascinating. Uh, so the, today's like panel, the title of the panel is Italian Colonialism and Contestant Citizenship. And we have like uh, three uh, amazing speakers like in this panel. And uh, I will intro start introducing our first uh, panelist uh, um, this afternoon, Daniela Luigia Cagliotti, uh, who is a professor of modern and contemporary history at the University of Naples, Federico II, and coordinator of the PhD program in global history governance of the Scuola Superiore Meridionale. Um, Daniela has been visiting fellow at many prestigious institutions, including University College London, Harvard University, the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. Uh, she's co-editor of Contemporanea, Rivista dell'Ottocento e del Novecento, and member of the International Committee of Scientific and Strategic Orientation of the Collège de France. Uh, since September 2019, she's also been the president of the Italian Society for the Study of Contemporary History. She has published extensively on 19th century migration, minorities, social classes, and more recently on enemy aliens and citizenship in World War I. Uh, like among her more recent publication is uh, War and Citizenship, Enemy Aliens and National Belonging from the French Revolution to the First World War. We have seen the cover like uh, this morning. So like uh, Daniela, please. Thank you. Clock. So, um, thank you, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Marla. Thank you, Aliza, for this invitation and to be at this very interesting conference. So, my contribution today focuses on a kind of leftover of my previous uh, of, my, of my book. I mean, I, 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 there is something I addressed uh, in my book. My, but from a different kind of perspective, and I'm now digging a little bit more on, on it using uh, mainly um, Italian archives, um, uh, and especially the, the archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So this contribution focuses on the mass expulsion of Italian subjects from the Ottoman Empire during the Italo-Turkish War of 1911-1912. The war is known in Italy as the Libyan War. But actually, it was a war uh, for the conquest of Tripolitania that then became Libya. But basically, it was a war against the Ottoman Empire. So I think it's kind of more correct to uh, uh, call it the Italo-Turkish War, also because the war was not uh, waged uh, against the Ottoman Empire only in Tripolitania, but the war went also to the Middle East Italian troops came to the Middle East and then came to the Dodecanese. So the war expanded in the whole Mediterranean. Um, this contribution takes at start at starting point the, the idea uh, that also Pamela developed this, this morning and everyone is in a certain way develop, de developing that citizenship is disputed, is conflictual, is contingent. And that disputes, com conflicts, and contingencies are, uh, I think, better seen from the vantage point of a moment of crisis. So the war waged by Italy for the conquest of Tripolitania. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, looking at war, looking at moment in which, I mean, con I mean disputes become even more uh, complicated and difficult to, to disentangle, I think, exposes uh, in, a, in a better way, the, um, the, the uh, various dimension of, of, of citizenship. Um, the paper will also, I mean, my contribution will also try to show the tensions that the very concept of Italianness underwent during the conflict. Uh, for the purpose of this contribution, I consider citizenship to be mainly the status that define uh, defines the legal relationship between uh, an individual and a state. And I will use, uh, during this contribution, citizenship and nationalities as synonyms. 
Uh, before enter, entering the narrative about the Italo-Turkish War and the expulsion of Italians from the Ottoman Empire, I would like to just briefly mention three, uh, three questions. So the first one uh, is, what is citizenship for? Uh, so I think that in order to kind of avoid the risk of anachronism, we need uh, always to ask ourselves uh, ourselves, what the meaning of citizenship at the time was. Citizenship had no universal, had not, has not universal meaning, and it entailed different obligations and rights. So the second question is, what it exactly, what it meant exactly to be an Italian citizen at the beginning of the 20th century? So basically, it meant different things for men and for women, and also for different generations of people. Uh, women enjoyed uh, only derivative citizenship, uh, taking on their husband's nationality, could not transmit citizenship, and until 1919, uh, and then again with fascism, Italian women were required to obtain their husband's authorization uh, before taking up anything, a job, um, business, whatever. Um, so, why is not working? Okay. <laughs> um, for men, citizenship uh, was above all about obligations, compulsory conscription. Uh, as for rights, very few rights uh, were attached to the status of a citizen in Italy at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, think about political rights, I mean, the, the basic political rights. Uh, we are in 1911, 1912, um, the, 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 the law on male universal suffrage is not passed yet, so the majority of men in Italy did not vote at the time. Uh, and also there were very limited role for provisions and so on and so forth. Um, however, uh, for all Italian citizens, and not only for all Italian, not, not only for Italian, but in general, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were two kind of fundamental rights that were, that were linked to citizenship. So the first one was the right not to be expelled. You cannot expel someone who is your own citizen because no one else would take, would take him or her unless uh, um, the, 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 the right of asylum is recognized. And the second fundamental thing, and we spoke a lot about this in a certain way, also this morning with, uh, the, during, I mean, Pamela in a certain way evoked many times uh, this, this issue, this issue and, and Roberta did yesterday a lot. The other fundamental right is the right to be protected abroad. So the state has an obligation to protect uh, its own citizens, whether they are poor, rich, black, or white. Uh, but if they are citizens, they can always claim, they can always raise a claim to the consulate or to the, or to the embassy. Um, and as we said this morning, in a certain way, at this, in this period, citizenship was more important for those who move than for those who, who, who stayed. Um, naturalization in Italy at the time was a particularly complicated process, uh, but then very few foreigners at the beginning of the 20th century came to Italy. So, I mean, there were very few people uh, asking for uh, naturalization and when very few people uh, who were in, interested in uh, becoming Italians. Um, the third uh, thing that I would like to raise is what, uh, and this is specific to the, the thing we are, I'm, I'm going to, to tell you this, more, this afternoon, is what it meant to be an Italian citizen uh, who was living and working in the Ottoman Empire. Because uh, this add, uh, add, add a, an, another layer, and a, and a very important layer, uh, because uh, Italian citizenship at the time was a kind of privileged 
citizenship, as it was French citizenship, British citizenship, German citizenship, Austro-Hungarian citizenship, because all these countries, Christian countries, um, enjoyed the privilege for, for their own subject, the privilege of extraterritoriality and capitulations. So being an Italian uh, at the time, at the beginning of the 20th century in the Ottoman Empire meant basically having various privileges, rights, and immunities, uh, having the, the, the possibility to appeal to the consular jurisdiction, so not to be tried in a Muslim uh, court, the privilege of paying a very uh, uh, um, basic duties and, and um, custom duties, and I mean, having the liberty, basically, to move uh, within the Ottoman Empire almost uh, without uh, restriction. So it was really important to be, to have one of these citizenship, citizenship that kind of wait and, and was waiting, waiting a lot in a certain way. Um, so the war broke out uh, at the end of September 1911. It, Italy waged war. Uh, on the Ottoman Empire, and in a certain way, waging the war in order to legitimize the, um, the starting of the war, it made appeal to their citizens, because the war was waged because uh, they, I mean, they, they, in the ultima ultimatum that Italy gave to the Ottoman Empire, uh, Italy asked the Ottoman consent to the occupation of Tripolitania, on the grounds that Italian citizens there were being threatened, threatened by Muslim fanatics. So the idea was, we wage war because we are going to protect, we would like to protect our citizens. So first and foremost, the problem of Italy has in this moment is not the colonial expansion, which was the real, I mean, the real issue, but it was in the, in the wording in, in of the, of the, of the uh, war declaration, it was the idea of protecting citizens uh, abroad. Um, at the beginning of the conflict, uh, both uh, Italy and the Ottoman Empire promised to treat uh, the subject of the enemy in a, in a fair way, uh, which was uh, relatively easy for Italy because there were very few Ottoman subjects in Italy. There were almost, I mean, according to the census of 1911 census, there were something like 1,200 uh, Ottoman citizens on, on Italian soils. Whether on Italian soil, where, where, whereas in the Ottoman Empire, there were, I mean, a number which is, according to sources, uh, which are very, I mean, difficult to kind of disentangle is, I mean, but anyway, in the Ottoman Empire there were lots of Italian, possibly uh, a number between 30,000 and 80,000 Italians scattered throughout the empire. The majority of them were uh, people uh, living in the European provinces of the, of the Ottoman Empire. So let's say Smyrna, Constantinople, Salonika, uh, but also in the um, uh, Middle East provinces, Aleppo, Damascus, <coughs> uh, Jerusalem, um, and then there were, I mean, mm, uh, Italians, Italians all, all over. And this group was a very uh, composite group. I mean, there were missionaries, there were priests, there were merchants, lots of merchants. Um, there were also lots of workers, workers uh, uh, who at the time were employed uh, mainly in the uh, in the building of the uh, Berlin-Baghdad railway. Um, and this group was, uh, according to the Italian consul in Constantinople, uh, made of 20% of recent, uh, of people who, are, who are, have arrived recently, so basically between the 1880s and the 
beginning of the 20th century. But 80% were people who had been living in the Ottoman Empire for ages. So people who had an extremely loose relationship with Italy. So they identify as Italian citizenship basically out of convenience because of the capitulation, but many of them did not even speak uh, Italian or use Italian uh, among other languages. Itali Italian in, a cer in certain provinces was a kind of lingua franca, but in, other, in, others, in others not. So uh, the, the Italian consul in Smyrna in 1911 distinguished very clearly between a truly Italian colony and a colony of mixed Italo, uh, Italo uh, Levantine. Um, uh, the expulsion of the Italian, I, I have to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just oh, running out of time. Okay. The expulsion of Italians loomed large since the beginning of the war. The Ottoman government threatened the mass expulsion of Italians as a retaliation, retaliation measure, among others against the Italian attacks on Tripolitania first, and later the attacks on the Middle East and the Aegean uh, Islands. Um, the war started at a time of internal difficulties for the Ottomans. There were lots of tension um, within the, 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 the Ottoman cabinet, um, but I don't have the time to, to elaborate on this. Uh, but in general, I mean, at the time, uh, there were bitter feelings um, um, uh, against foreigners in general. In, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, there, there, there have been um, there had been already boycotts, for example, of of Greek uh, of Greeks uh, during the um, the upheavals in Crete. Uh, there had there had been uh, demonstration against the foreigners coming from Bulgaria <laughs> uh, because of the tension in um, and also against Austria-Hungary after the annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina by, by, by Austria-Hungary. So there, there was resentment against foreigners, and part of this resentment also kind of went into the direction of non-Muslim uh, Ottoman, Ottoman subjects, so Christian, mainly, mainly, mainly Christian. Um, so when the war uh, broke out, Italian subjects were recast as enemy aliens, um, and the Ottoman cabinet suppressed immediately the capitulation with Italy. So the Italians uh, lose, uh, lost uh, all, all their, their privileges uh, at, uh, at the time. They had to pay a 100% custom uh, duty. They could not uh, any longer uh, sell their property or acquire new property. Um, the, the Italian, hospi uh, uh, Italian hospitals were kind of shut down. There was a uh, in order to shut down also the, um, uh, the, the banks, the Italian banks who, who, which operated in the, in the Ottoman Empire, in particular the Banco di Roma. Um, the, the journalists of Corriere della Sera, of Tribuna, of Giornale d'Italia were expelled from, uh, immediately from, 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 the, from the Ottoman Empire. And the, the masses, and, and, and the government started to uh, threatened the, the, the expulsion. The expulsion uh, took place basically in three, uh, in, three, in three steps. So the first step was the threat of the expulsion, um, but then nothing happened also because that there was kind of diplomatic activity trying to prevent uh, and try to kind of uh, take down some of this, this idea of um, expelling uh, the, um, the, the, the Italian. Uh, then uh, there was uh, uh, kind of the, the real, the, the threat transformed in a real um, implementation of a small expulsion for uh, the Italians living in the uh, vilayet of uh, Beirut, Aleppo, and Damascus after the bombardment of the Beirut harbor. Uh, but Italians you know, decided, many Italians decided to, to go somewhere else, to the closest vilayet, who had not been affected by the, uh, by the, by the provision. The, the, the third step was the actual expulsion of all the Italians living in the Ottoman Empire, which was proclaimed with a decree issued on May 20, 
1912. Um, uh, this uh, uh, measure uh, was taken to uh, mobilize also the, the sympathy, uh, in order to mobilize the sympathy of um, European public, public opinion, the government, the, the Ottoman government issued a, 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 a text in which uh, the, uh, all the atro atrocities that Italy was kind of practicing in, in Tripolitania were exposed. Uh, I don't have the time to, 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 read, to read this text, which is uh, uh, otherwise a, a very interesting uh, text. Um, Italy, of course, reacted, and no one else in Europe actually reacted because uh, Britain and France and Germany tried to kind of remain um, neutral. I mean, uh, within this, um, with this uh, um, uh, thing. So the expulsion order, um, I'm trying to, 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 to cut it shorter. The expulsion or, or order confronted Italians uh, independently of whether they identified with Italy or approved or not of the war um, with different alternatives. So I'm just mentioning briefly these alternatives. So first of all, accept expulsion and go back to a country uh, where many of them have never set foot on uh, and whose language may, many of them did not even speak. The second alternative was migrating again, temporarily or definitively toward new destination. Uh, the third alternative was hide and maintain a low profile to escape expulsion. Uh, the fourth alternative, which is a very interesting alternative, was renounce voluntarily to Italian citizenship for good, embrace Ottoman subjecthood and stay, or um, accepted the offer, more or less forced, of a new nationality. The, the fifth alternative, and possibly there are many others, but this is, these are, according to my sources, the main alternatives uh, Italians faced. The, the fifth alternative was uh, apply for uh, another, for a different citizenship. So for example, apply for German citizenship or for Austro-Hungarian citizenship. Uh, as the available sources document, Italians experienced uh, uh, experience all these paths. By the end uh, of October 1912, when the war was over and another war was starting, because the, uh, the Balkan Wars um, started right immediately after the end, or oh, actually, the, the Balkan War started even before the war um, with Italy uh, ended. By the end of October 1912, um, about 9,000 Italian um, expellees had been repatriated to Italy. Um, a number impossible to establish boarded ships, trains, and other means of transportation toward destination all over the world, Greece, Bulgaria, Odessa, Romania, but also London, uh, Buenos Aires, New York. So people, I mean, there was an, another diaspora. I mean, there was a, di a diaspora within the diaspora. Uh, speaking of the many <laughs> diasporas uh, mentioned by Pamela this morning. Um, and according to one of the leading Italian newspapers, Il Corriere della Sera, uh, by May 30, uh, German consulate uh, had uh, released uh, 750 collective passport for 18,000 Italians. Uh, the, 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 um, the delivery of passport was entrusted to Germany because Germany had been entrusted of uh, the protection of Italian interest um, at the beginning of the war because the, the, all the consul, the, the embassies, the embassy had, had to be shut down. So Germany was acting uh, as a proxy for Italy in the in, in the Ottoman Empire, and this provoked also lo lots of lots of issues. Um, so by the end of the war. Uh, by the end of October, uh, there were more than 9,000 9, people who fled toward Italy, lots of people, thousands of people who fled 
uh, to other destination, uh, at least 500 Italians, uh, um, especially in the district of Smyrna and Salonica, uh, who had been granted Ottoman citizenship, and a few dozens Italian, Italians uh, who managed to stay acquiring German or Austro-Hungarian um, citizenship. Um, interestingly, this expulsion and the choices that Italians had uh, to make happened when the Italian parliament was involved in the approval of the first comprehensive citizenship law um, and was in particular struggling, as Roberta Perger reminded us yesterday, with the problematic issue of dual nationality. Expellees were recast as refugees uh, in need of help, as brothers and sisters, victims of the brutality and lack of civilization of the Ottomans. The Prime Minister Giolitti and his cabinet transformed the Ottoman expulsion of the Italian and the answering refugee crisis into a powerful propaganda tool, using it to restore the damaged international uh, image of, uh, of the country. So there were all these ships boarding into uh, Italian harbors in Brindisi, Naples, and people flocking to welcome, uh, chanting, welcome these refugees, chanting Viva l'Italia. Uh, so I have one minute, I know. Uh, <laughs> Um, my, 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 my clock say, says the same, uh, unfortunately, uh, even, even, even less. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, after this moment of uh, discover of Italianness and excitement about these people, uh, which lasted no more than uh, four or five months, uh, these refugees uh, became a burden uh, because they started to, and this is just two words, because they started to um, ask the Italian state for help, for compensation, for subsidies, and so on and so forth. So uh, Italianness all of a sudden uh, became a problem. So in a certain way, it was, uh, um, preferable uh, to um, let all these people, and this was what, he, what, what really happened, to let these people come back to the Ottoman Empire after the peace treaty restored peace and restored the capitulation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Daniela for this like very complex and effective uh, analysis of the ramification of the expulsion of Italians from the uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, our second uh, like speaker today is uh, Nicola Camilleri uh, who received his like PhD from the uh, Free University of Berlin in 2017 and is currently a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies Southeast, Southeast Europe uh, at the University of Rijeka. Uh, he is affiliated to the University of Padua, where he worked from 2019 to 2022 as a member of the European Research Council project uh, entitled The Dark Side of the Belle Epoque, Political Violence and Armed Associations in Europe Before the First World War. Uh, as an outcome of the research carried out in this project, he's writing like a book on armed sociability of civilians in Imperial Germany. His first book investigated norms and practices of citizenship of, like uh, in the German and Italian colonial empire, focusing on the case studies uh, of German East Africa and Italian Eritrea. Uh, like today, uh, Nicola will present a paper entitled Study Shades of, of Citizenship in the Italian Colonial Empire. Thank you so much. Thanks for the... Uh, Introduction, very kind. Thank you especially to Marla Stone for the very, very kind invitation. And I'm very pleased and honored to be here in this special place and among so many esteemed scholars. Albert Memi. Uh, where is my, yeah. Like this? No, yeah, this. Albert Memi. 
a French Tunisian sociologist and writer of Jewish descent, wrote a famous pamphlet published in 1957 for the first time, The Portrait du Colonisé Précédé par Portrait du Colonisateur, the, uh, translated into English as The Colonizer and the Colonized. To describe the condition of the colonized subject, he wrote, I quote, the colonized enjoys none of the attributes of citizenship, neither his own, which is dependent, contested, and smoothed, nor that of the colonizer. He can hardly adhere to one or claim the other. Not, not having his just place in the community, not enjoying the rights of a modern citizen, not being subject to his normal duties, not voting, not bearing the burden of community affairs, he cannot feel like a true citizen." End of quote. Keeping in mind this quote, I will present uh, in my paper today a short overview of the different shades of citizenship the Kingdom of Italy created for its colonial empire. Between the 1880s and the 1940s, the Kingdom of Italy ruled over several millions of people in its overseas colonies. Compared with other uh, European colonial powers, the newly established Italian nation state could not rely upon long experiences in ruling over new territories and their inhabitants. So it faced the challenge to create a citizenship regime for its colonies, while at the same time it formulated new citizenship regulations in the metropole. The first outcome of which was the new citizenship law of 1912. When it comes to the question of citizenship in European colonialism, it's usual to refer to the dichotomy, the division between citizens and subjects, as we have seen today. Uh, this division expresses the essential inequality of a citizenship regime in which the colonizers kept the legal status from home, not hallowing the local population of the colonial territories they conquered to share the same status. The local population thus was segregated in a minor legal status as the one described at the beginning by Albert Memmi. The scores and practices of colonial citizenship in the Italian colonies did not differ so much from those from which characterized colonial empires of French, Britain, German, Germany, and Portugal, or other. At the core of this so-called rule of colonial difference, there was the ideology of a supposed different degree of civilization and race. But once acknowledged uh, racism as a key ideology in the regulation of colonial citizenship, in my research I tried to look at also other factors that play the role in the wide context of citizenship regime. Moreover, I tried to pay attention to the agency of colonized subjects and to the question of how the addressees of these norms faced colonial citizenship. In the first years uh, of Italian rule in uh, colonial Eritrea, end of the 19th century, no regulations existed for the citizenship status of the local population. Nevertheless, several sources of the time mention the terms subjects or Italian subjects referring to the inhabitants of those territories. So citizenship was not used as a term uh, since the very beginning. A first definition of who was a colonial subject in Italian Eritrea was given by the judicial system, Ordinamento Juridico, in 1908. It stated that the suddito coloniale was a person who was not an Italian citizen or citizens of any other European states who was born in the colony and belonged to the tribes, tribes of the colony. Subjects were also those Africans or those uh, people from other regions of the Red Sea who were employed at the colonial administration or had lived at least two years in the colony without interruption. The same text also dictated the legal status of the assimilated population. Assimilati, so was the term, were considered foreigners belonging to a population whose degree of civilization wasn't seen as matching that of the Europeans. So a hierarchy of, of uh, citizenship status. The, why is this important, this, uh, this definition? 
because these uh, uh, citizenship relations didn't substantially change with the new uh, with the new rules in the 1920s, and the, a more sharp uh, modification was brought just in the 1930s with the law in 1933. But we uh, I will come back to this later. So being a colonial subject was something clearly different than being an Italian citizen in Eritrea. Concretely, this meant that, for instance, native were subjected to the so-called customary law, but the sentences were issued by Italian judges, sometimes simply colonial clerks. Many other restrictions cannot be addressed here. So this impacted many sectors of like colonial society, of course. Uh, was it possible? Um, so it meant to be basically kept in an inferior position in the colonial society. But was it possible for a colonial subject to become an Italian citizen? No legal forms, this is surprising, no legal forms, norms formally prohibited a naturalization of natives, which means, means that the colonial subject was formally allowed to become a citizen. Nevertheless, a non-written rule uh, ban ruled the administrative practices on the spot. When in 1914, the Syrian trader residing in Adi Kaye, a village in Eritrea, uh, applied for the Italian citizenship with um, this was rejected by the colonial authority. Indeed, the Carabinieri stated that he could not really be considered, considered as earning the, I quote, big honor he is aiming for. Indeed, he cannot boast special merits and a great attachment to the institution of the Italian kingdom. Moreover, Awarding him this special honorific mention would not make a good impression on the community, end of quote. A research conducted on the, um, ah, sorry, <laughs> uh, too, too short, too, too quick. A short uh, research conducted on colonial Eritrea has proven that naturalization of natives, natives never was a real option. An exceptional case which I was lucky enough to stumble upon is the story of Sengal Vorknech. Sengal was an interpreter at the service of the Italian colonial administration and he spent his life between the colony of Eritrea and the kingdom of Italy, working on different assignments, among others as a lecturer of Amaric and Tigrinia at the Instituto Orientale in Naples. In 1919, he obtained the Italian citizenship shortly after the Treaty of Versailles, Versailles Mark at the end of the war. Sengal Vorknech's naturalization process began in 1917 when he submitted his naturalization request, which I could not find, unfortunately. The naturalization was at the outcome or the end point of a long process that began in 1906 when he was working as an interpreter in Asmara and applied for Italian citizenship for the first time. I was lucky enough to find also some documents uh, written by him. He was probably very confident that his request would be granted without difficulty. He attended the Italian school, he was fluent in Italian, so he felt Italian. But uh, quite, opposite, quite the opposite happened. At the end of a dispute, so he, he started a dispute with the authority, so, and this document, documents, are there, I can know to testimony this. At the end of the dispute, in which he tried to fight what, what, for what he deemed his right to become a citizen, the governor of Eritrea ended the discussion with the following sentence, I quote, for no reason can a native in the colony be allowed to hold Italian citizenship, end of quote. Per nessuna ragione può ammettersi che in colonia vi sia un indigeno che abbia la cittadinanza italiana. A crucial role in the long story of how Sengal became an Italian citizen is played by the First World War. During the general mobilization, he was enlisted in the military and served uh, from May 1915 to July 1919, while also keeping his job as a lecturer at the Orientale. Uh, during the war, 
St. Galvor Knecht was given the opportunity to prove himself a true Italian patriot. He did not fight on the front lines, nevertheless he earned the deep esteem of his superior, who finally described him as an, I quote, educated, intelligent officer with high military and civic feelings, with a frank character, firm in his intentions, yet at the same time disciplined, end of quote. When uh, does in, um, it's, it's still interesting to report the information that the colonial government collected from the Carabinieri on him in the colony. I quote the report. Sengal, for the time he resided in this colony, always kept good behavior. It was not possible uh, to um, determine which course of study Sengal might have done, but it turns out that he had a certain culture and is serious and respectful. The same report quotes also the fact, mentions also the fact that he was dressed like an Italian. He used to eat like an Italian. He gave up the customs and the habits of the natives of the, of the colony. So education, lifestyle, and good reputation essentially contributed to making him an Italian citizen. At the time, at this time, like Eritrea and Somalia were not the kingdoms of Italy's only colonies. Following a heavy nationalistic campaign, the Italy, uh, Italy attacked the Ottoman Empire in an effort to expand the Italian colonial empires in North Africa. The military conflict was resolved in favor of Italy, which gained the provinces of Tripolitania and Cyrenaica as, as two new colonies. When in October 1912, these provinces fully came under, I mean, came under Italian, not fully, but came under Italian sovereignty, Citizenship policies on the imperial level became more nuanced. The local inhabitants who had been Ottoman subjects uh, until that moment received a specific uh, legal status that tied them to the Kingdom of Italy. This was called the subjectude of Libyan natives, sudditanza degli indigeni della Libia, and was regulated by a decree uh, of like 6 April 1913. Sabina Donati has rightly underlined the difference in the legal status between the colonial subjects in the Horn of Africa and those in North Africa. The latter could not only enjoy the personal status and related civil rights according to their religion, but also fill certain public officers. In 1919, this is interesting for the development of like this colonial uh, citizenship, the story of the history of like Italian citizenship at all, this colonial subject would give way to a new form of colonial citizenship for the Libyan territories under Italian rule, which was named Italian citizenship in Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, and Cyrenaica. Cittadinanza Italiana in Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. What is interesting of this construction is that it's seen as the expression of a more liberal colonial policy that left generous room for negotiation the so-called Wilsonian movement, etc., after the First World War. According to the norm, Norme Fondamentali per l'Assetto della Tripolitania that regulated these things, every person born in Tripolitania was an Italian citizen. But we need to pay attention to this definition. As a matter of fact, however, being an Italian metropolitan citizen uh, was uh, something different than being an Italian Libyan citizen. The statutes that, I mean, again, the, the test is regulated this uh, issue, in fact, envisaged the possibility for Italian Libyan citizens to apply for Italian metropolitan citizenship. A list of conditions made naturalization a far from easy task overall. The acquisition of Italian metropolitan citizenship for Libyans meant the loss of their personal status because naturalization meant that they had to obey, uh, obey Italian laws. So in my opinion, this naturalization policy represented the means for the colonial state to integrate part of the local middle class into its ruling system. Uh, in the citizenship policies adopted by the Kingdom of Italy in Tripolitania and Cyrenaica after the First World War, it's possible to detect traces of the heavy anti-colonial conflict that justified the creation of new political regulations. 
the new Italian Libyan citizenship too must be framed within this context of like heavy anti-colonial resistance against Italian. So it was a concession, but it was a concession facing these anti-colonial uh, conflicts and revolts. Based on a short analysis of administrative practices, I would say that the situation in the North African colonial territories were, was quite similar that in the colonial Eritrea. Here too, naturalization emerges as a kind of an administrative process reserved for the colonial middle class or upper class, if ever. On the other hand, the local Arabs who were Italian Libyan citizens despite their will and who mostly opposed foreign rule, Italian foreign rule, had little interest in applying for metropolitan citizenship. Indeed, they are quite, quite absent from the records I have, uh, I have analyzed, but also the work of Roberta Perger shows that for the uh, years after of the fascism, only eight, I mean, Roberta could find only eight Muslim Libyans that obtained and received Italian citizenship between 1928 and 1938. So much as in the Horn of Africa, citizenship policies were based on the principle of the superiority of Italian citizens, colonizers, in terms of civilization and race. The native populations was not deemed equal to the Italian, and this reflected in its re, uh, legal status. But the colonial, Italian colonial history doesn't end with this, as we know. While the Italian kingdom kept ruling Eritrea and Somalia and Libya, plans for the expansion into and occupation of the Ethiopian empire were made. In 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia with a huge military force. Despite the strong resistance from Ethiopian side, Italy was able to occupy the capital, Addis Ababa, in May 1936. It soon controlled the whole country, although tenuously. With the establishment of the fascist empire in East Africa, Ethiopia and the former colonies Eritrea and Somalia were united in the so-called Africa Orientale Italiana, so in one colony. The law issued in 1933 was extended to the unified colony. This law is important among other, reason, among other reasons because it eliminated the status of the assimilati, assimilated population, so-called assimilati. Why is this important? I explain now, because the population was then divided now between citizens and subjects only, and as colonial subjects were recognized also those persons of African and Asia or Asian origin who had served in the military or the colonial administration. Colonial subjecthood, so la sudditanza coloniale, could be applied for by persons who had migrated to the colonies from Asia or African, Asian or Af African regions. Why is this important again? Formalizing access to colonial subject to made access to the Italian citizenship via naturalization an unachievable goal for non-European members of colonial society. So what it means when people from uh, neighboring regions came to Ethiopia and wanted to apply for citizenship, the authority clearly said you can apply for subject to but not for citizenship. It was quite clear at this point. So um, it was um, so formalizing uh, access to colonial subject to made access to uh, I mean this uh, and granting citizenship to colonial subjects was inappropriate and this was a common opinion. Indeed a legal scholar of the time Umberto Borsi wrote in 1937 I quote uh, that granting citizenship does not represent a serious expression of civil progress and does not contribute to our national dignity or to the regular exercising of our colonizing action. So I think it's, there is a kind of like uh, fil rouge that uh, we can follow from the beginning and this means that the naturalization is really something that doesn't impact 
colonial native population uh, at all. So for the inhabitants of the colonial territories under Italian rule, access to citizenship was hardly a chance. Understanding citizenship and identity in Italian contemporary history, what we have tried to do very nicely here these two days, cannot avoid taking into account this denial and this exclusion. Many of the farmer, oh, oh, sorry, many of the farmer non-citizens or colonial subjects are finally grandfathers or ancestors of many migrants who come to Europe and see their access to citizenship just as much obstructed. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Nicola, for this like very like broad, well constructed, concise paper that really very well showed uh, the difficulty, uh, ambiguity of like defining uh, uh, like the idea, but also the reality of citizenship uh, in the uh, col Italian colonial empire. Uh, now we have our like uh, third and last speaker uh, of the panel, uh, Simona Bere. Uh, who received her PhD in History and Comparative European Political and Legal Institution at the University of Messina in 2013. She currently teaches at the University of Calabria and works at the historical archives of Banca Intesa. Uh, she has published extensively on Italian colonial administration in Libya and colonial citizenship. Uh, among her major works are like notab Notabili Libici e Funzionari Italiani, L'Amministrazione Coloniale in Tripolitania, published by Rubettini in 2015, and the co-edited volume, Citizens and Subjects of the Italian Colonies, Legal Constructions and Social Practices, published by Routledge in 2022. Uh, her more recent research field focuses on political and academic associations of African students in Italy during the Cold War. Please welcome Simona. Thank you, and uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Marla Stone and the American Academy for inviting me. So my presentation will focus on a subject that has received little attention in the historiography, the history of European minorities in colonial Libya. In particular, lately, I've been studying how the status of the Maltese community in Tripoli changed after 1911, after Libya became an Italian uh, colony. What is really interesting, in my view, is how the relations between two European minorities, Italians and Maltese, changed after 1911 and became more uh, dialectical. Both Italian and Maltese, whose presence in, in Libya had a long history, were minorities in Libya and remain minorities uh, throughout the colonial period. They were, let's say, white islands in a brown lake. But after 1911, the Italians became a ruling minority and had to deal not only with the colonized subjects, but also with the Maltese minority, which were somehow <coughs> impossible to insert into the binary colonial logic. The presence of a Maltese community in Libya, especially in Western Libya, uh, Tripolitania, had a long history. Libya experienced a brief phase of domination by the Knights of Malta, during the early modern age. But beyond this uh, ephemeral conquest, the presence of a Maltese community in Libya must be framed in, a, in the process of Mediterranean mobility, which in the early modern age meant, for example, Mediterranean slavery that involved thousands of uh, Europeans. Perhaps the best known is the writer uh, Miguel de Cervantes. It was during the 19th century, at the same time as the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the military and the commercial expansion of Europe into uh, North Africa, that these uh, European communities assume a key role in the countries they lived in. For example, the Italian community in, uh, in Egypt. In 1911, when Italy occupied Libya, the Maltese community represented the largest of the European communities in the country. It was a urban community, 
concentrated in few coastal cities, especially Tripoli, Benghazi. From a linguistic and cultural point of view, they were very close to the Italians. Most Maltese spoke uh, Italian. They had Italian names, Ugo, Salvatore, and, and they were Catholic. The religious factor, on the one hand, favored the closeness of the two communities, but at the same time, the devotion to the Pope provoked a strong reaction in the Maltese community when the Kingdom of Italy was constituted in 1861. Almost all the Maltese in Tripoli were British subjects, as Malta has been under British control since 1815. According to the Italian consul in Tripoli, Mr. Ansaldi, the bond with London was only formal and did not reflect any feeling of belonging or loyalty. Although it was a well-established com uh, community, mobility was very high, especially between Libya and Malta, Libya and Italy, but also uh, towards Tunisia to find better job uh, opportunities. The Maltese community met the Italian occupation of Libya without uh, either particular enthusiasm or hostility. For their, uh, their part, the Italian authorities did not show special interest in the Maltese community during the very early, early years of the occupation. It was only after the First World War that the position of the Maltese within the colonial society assumed a political relevance. At the end of the conflict, Italy found itself in a situation of military and political precariousness. The spread of the Arab nationalism in Libya and the strength of the resistance movement raised the issue of the Maltese community and its role within the colonial society. The fear was that the, was that the Maltese could take the side of the colonized subjects. An interesting case was the debate on elections for the Tripoli City Council which were supposed to be held in the early 20s. Article 27 of the Tripolitanian Constitution that was issued, as Nicola said before, in 1919, stated that the city council members were elected every three years by citizens, both Italian metropolitan citizens and Italian Libyan citizens, the colonized people. As British subjects, the Maltese did not have the right to vote. However, the risk that such an essential sector of the Tripoli society would be excluded from choosing city council members raised significant protests reflected in the local press. On December 1921, the Tripoli newspaper La Nuova Italia published an article signed by a group of Maltese supporting the right, the right of the Maltese to vote in local, in local elections. The article explained that the cultural proximity between Italians and Maltese meant the latter should be considered part of the Italian nation. Their condition was of Italiani non regnicoli, simili, uh, similar to that of Italian-speaking inhabitants in the Austrian territories before 1918. The article underlined that, as the Maltese were granted the right to vote in local elections, in Italy, in the kingdom. Therefore, the right must be also valid in Tripoli, in Libya. Obviously, such a position reaffirmed the proximity of Tripoli's Maltese community to the Italians and implicitly reproposed a theme that, that would emerge with particular emphasis during the fascist period, the Italianità of Malta. So the Maltese in Tripoli should vote not only because they were culturally close to the Italians in Libya, but also because Malta was to be considered Italian. In Malta, the public opinion was struck by the news, the refusal to allow uh, the Maltese to vote. The fact raised alarm in the Italian diplomatic authorities. They were afraid of the severe repercussions within Maltese political debate. The revolt in Valletta, the capital of Malta, of uh, 7th June 1919, had marked the peak of anti-British and pro-Italian sentiment among the population of Malta. According to the Italian consul in Valletta, a hostile attitude from Tripoli colonial, Tripoli's colonial government would undermine Rome credibility, since Italy had proclaimed itself the defender as the defender 
of Maltese rights. In addition, the consul in La Valletta stressed that the issue of local elections did not only concern Libya or Malta, but also affected the attitudes of the, of, of the several Maltese communities around the Mediterranean. The, co the consul opinion was that, uh, quote, for more sentimental debt legal reasons, the Maltese are very sensitive to the manifestations of Italian towards them because of the strenuous defense of the Italian language as a national language, which is now the basis of local political life. I must finally point out, in, as in many countries where colonies of Maltese immigrants uh, come into contact with colonies of Italians, in the presence of population of other races, the Maltese element, almost naturally, is associated in cultural events with the life of the Italian colonies with which it is in contact." Uh, In 1922, the Italian consul in Malta and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were willing to let the Maltese vote in Libya, but the governor of Tripoli, Giuseppe Volpi, was strongly opposed, considering Maltese allegations of devotion to Italy to be untrue. According to Volpi, the Maltese had a simple and very effective way of demonstrating their bond to Rome, renounce British nationality in favor of Italian. Of course, a substantial disincentive to naturalization was compulsory military service prescribed by Italian law, but not by the British. Moreover, considering the ties that part of the Maltese community continued to maintain with Malta, the loss of British citizenship would, uh, would have reduced them to foreigners in their homeland. The issue of voting rights for the Maltese must be considered in the context of North Africa in the early 20s. In the aftermath of the First World War, with the disruptive, disruptive emergence of Arab nationalism throughout North Africa, colonial governments committed to defining the role of European minorities within colonial society. For example, in Tunisia, France undertook a policy of assimilation towards European communities, imposing French nationality on Italians and Maltese living in Tunisia. Similarly, the Italian, Italian authorities aimed to strengthen the colony's European core. The consolidation of this white core responded to a need to contain the pressure from below, particularly from the colonized people and the anti-colonial movement. Of course, in addition to the specific North African context, the case of the Maltese in Tripoli must be framed into the intricate relation that link Italy and Malta, with particular reference to Italian ambitions. During the 20s, the pressure on the Maltese grew they started to become a threat to the Italian colonial authorities, especially for Giuseppe Volpi, governor of uh, Western Libya. Volpi considered the Maltese ambiguous. They were not colonized subjects. They were foreigners. They held a British passport, but they spoke Italian. They were Catholic, as the majority of the Italians in uh, Libya. Some of them, were married to Italians, especially Italians who moved to Libya coming from Tunisia or Sicilians. Volpi was very suspicious and used citizenship as an instrument of control over the Maltese of Tripoli. The governor was concerned that these uh, British subjects, well integrated into the life of the country, would threaten Italian national interests and pursue the interests of a foreign power. Their status as foreigners not only restricted their participation in political life, but also conditioned their social, uh, their social life, in particular as workers. In June 1922, uh, 22, a government decree stipulated that foreigners of European origin employed in the colonial public administration must apply for Italian citizenship within one year. If they did not obtain or request Italian nationality, they would be fired. Many Maltese 
were employed in crucial sectors of the colonial administration. There were railways, public work, the Bank of Italy, and even in the military administration. Governor, Volpi, uh, governor's, uh, governor Volpi, Volpi's decision arose widespread protests. In a very poor country like Libya, it was not easy for workers to find another job after being fired. Not only the British consul in Tripoli, Monaghan, but also the British uh, ambassador in Rome, Ronald Graham, took action to prevent the dismissal of the Maltese that would condemn them to poverty. However, the British authorities themselves recognized the, correct, the correctness of the governor's decision, having in mind that every request for derogation made by the British authorities in favor of the Maltese offered Italy the possibility of requesting preferential treatment for Italian citizens in the territories of the British Empire. Indeed, London was unwilling to grant easy credit to Italy to protect its Maltese subjects. As before, in the case of the Italian election, Volpi's position was very harsh, whilst other Italian authorities had different attitudes. Both the Italian consul in Valletta and the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs hoped for a conci uh, conciliatory solution. They proposed to consider the Maltese as, quote, Italian nationals even without being Italian citizens, unquote. Luigi Federzoni, at that time Ministry of the Colonies, was convinced that an open gesture towards the Maltese was necessary both for the devotion they had shown towards the colonial government, but also because dismissal would have negative repercussions in Malta, which Federzoni considered to be a country of, quote, Italian civilization and Italian language, unquote. Federzoni believed that the position of the Maltese in Libya had to be distinguished from that of other foreigners in light of their Italianita. The risk of dismissal written by the colonial administration, pushed many Maltese workers to apply for Italian citizenship, of course, the metropolitan citizenship. Was this choice always painful? No, I don't think so. They chose to become Italian because it was useful. It was a matter of interest. In many diasporic communities, uh, characterized by uh, a multi-layered identity, this sense or the sense of belonging is not determined only by legal citizenship or defined by the authorities or by the legal institutions. It follows different paths. Starting in 1919, the colonial government began to reshape the role of Tripoli's Maltese community. Its orientation was to tie this minority to Italy, to avoid any solidarity between the Libyans and the Maltese. If the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Italian Consul in Valletta adopted a gradual, a, a soft approach, Governor Volpi supported a more aggressive assimilation strategy to make the Maltese into Italian citizens. Uh, this assimilation process accelerated du during the fascist period, when the relation between London and Rome deteriorated due to the competition over Malta and, from 1935, the war in Ethiopia. Therefore, the position of the Maltese within the colonial society became increasingly complicated and precarious. The gradual process of assimilation of the Maltese accelerated in mid-30s. The casus belli that gave Italy the opportunity to reaffirm the complete Italianità of this community was the need to resolve the long-standing issue of religious marriages, which arose in 1917 and remained unsolved for 20 years. From 1917, the British consul in Tripoli began to confront a difficult problem, namely the validity of religious marriages celebrated by uh, Maltese British subjects. In fact, the Italian uh, Civil Code of 1865 did not attribute legal value to such unions, which should be celebrated before an officer of the Italian civil state 
also in Libya, at least until uh, 1929 and the Lateran Treaty. <coughs> Failure to recognize the marital bond for Maltese subjects had enormous consequences. For example, it prevented the collection of insurance premiums, uh, premiums the claiming of benefits for married workers and access to inheritance. Above all, it posed in dramatic terms the problem of the offspring who turned out to be illegitimate and could not acquire their parents' citizenship. Those kids in the early 20s, more than 500 only in Tripoli, were not British subjects. They were stateless. And according to the Italian law in force in Libya, they should be considered as colonial subjects, as Italian Libyan. The failure to recognize the legal value of Maltese religious marriage had a dramatic consequences, not only of an economic, but also of a social nature, creating dangerous fractures within families. Apparently, the solution to this problem was very easy to celebrate the marriages before an Italian officer of the civil state. But the Italian imposition of the civil marriage was regarded by the Maltese, in particular by the ecclesiastic authorities, as a factor that weakened the community's identity, cemented by language and by belonging, belonging to the Catholic religion. Religion repre represented an identity marker, capable of defining the community Communities boundaries, both in Libyan, most, mostly a Muslim country, and in Malta, subject to British control. The problem of Maltese marriages remain unresolved for more than 20, uh, 20 years. It reemerged in 1936 when a member of the British Parliament, Petherick, gave a disapproving speech in the House of Commons. <laughs> accusing Italy of having imposed colonial citizenship on the stateless Maltese children, depriving them of British, uh, British nationality. The Tripoli authorities, uh, for their part, tried to reject the accusation, claiming that they were specials. The colonial governor of <laughs> Libya, Italo Balbo, claimed that uh, their only purpose was to feed anti-Italian propaganda in Malta, sponsored by the Strickland uh, political party in Malta. The pretext of the accusations launched by uh, Petherick against Italy are, of course, undeniable. However, it is equally irrefutable that the issue of the stateless offspring, some, some of them now uh, adults, became a very urgent problem. In 19, uh, 1936, the, uh, the number of Maltese who were by law considered colonial subjects was quite considerable. Nevertheless, such regulation represented an element of uh, subversion of the colonial hierarchy, since the Maltese, mostly Italian-speaking and Catholic, were equated with the colonized, mostly Arab, Berbers, and Muslims. It was a crack in the colonial building that needed to be repaired. The scenario was different in the mid-30s in, in compared with uh, uh, 15 years earlier. Relations between Italy and the UK had deter deteriorated. And in the meantime, more importantly, Italy has signed the Lateran Treaty in 1929. The 1929 agreement between the Holy See and the Kingdom of Italy recognized the validity of religiously celebrated marriages. Those between Maltese uh, celebrated uh, only in church after 1929 were recognized by the Italian and British authorities. However, for marriages before that date, no solution had, uh, had been found. Starting in 1936, the Italian authorities tried to remedy, uh, to remedy this confusing situation. For example, in 1936, the Libyan governor, Italo Balbo, uh, pushed for a diplomatic settlement on the matter. The turning point came in 1938. Writing to Balbo, Attilio Teruzzi, at that time under secretary of the, uh, to the Ministry of the Italian Africa, as the Ministry of the Colonies was renamed after, uh, renamed after 1937, 
affirmed that Maltese not recognized as British subjects were to be considered ipso jure Italians. According to Teruzzi, the government did not grant citizenship in this case, it is, it, as it was an acquired right, jure nativitatis. The Ministry for Foreign Affairs all, also embraced this assimilation, assimilationist line. The position of the Italian authorities was not a change of course, but an acceleration along the path of assimilation. It was also a symptom of reducing the room for maneuver of all minorities. In 1938, the Italian government issued the anti-Jewish laws, which affected Italian Jews in Libya and to a different extent, of course, also Libyan Jews. The outbreak of the Second World War uh, in a dramatic way highlighted the issue of foreign subjects in Libya. In 1940, a few months after Italy got involved in the conflict, Galeazzo Ciano, Minister for Foreign Affairs, invited the Minister to Italian Africa to consider those Maltese with British passports as Italiani non regnicoli, therefore no longer subjects of an enemy power. Ciano's decision saved the Maltese from retaliation and protected their assets. Simultaneously, it allowed the colonial government to expand the number of men who could be enlisted into the Italian army. However, these Maltese, uh, um, uh, however, Maltese subjects who had manifested anti-Italian attitudes face a different fate. They were in turn and expelled from the country. Several Anglo-Maltese were locked up in uh, different camps in Libya, for example, El Buerat camp, and also in Italy, for example, Bagna Ripoli uh, in Florence, Bagni di Lucca and Villa Basilica in, uh, in Lucca, and uh, close to Parma, a, a small town called Monte Chiarugolo. The war context accelerated the assimilation process of the Maltese, also favored by the expulsion of those community elements who had remained loyal to the British crown. Assimilation by the Italians and the forced expulsion of those individuals hostile to, Rome poli to Rome's politics broke up Tripoli's Maltese community. After the war, some Maltese returned, uh, returned to Libya, but only stayed a few years. The country's independence in 1951 and the rise of Gaddafi in 1969 reduced opportunities for the Maltese community and also for other communities of European origin. This was not a Libyan peculiarity. The history of the independence of African countries involved, for the most part, the expulsion or departure, voluntary departure of white communities. Apparently, the dynamics of African decolonization failed to redefine a new role for communities of European origin, reducing or even eliminating any space for coexistence in, new, in the new post-colonial order. The history of the Maltese in Tripoli from, liberal, from the liberal age to fascism is the history of a contested assimilation project that led after the Second World War to the disintegration of the community. The specific events that involved the community raised significant historiographical issues, the contradictions of citizenship in the colonial context, the sense of belonging and the loyalties of foreign minorities, fascist policies in the Mediterranean. The history of the Maltese in Tripoli is the history of a minority, but it's not a minor history. Thank you. Thank you, Simona, for this very interesting, detailed uh, paper that while focusing on the uh, Maltese community in Libya had much broader uh, implication and also complemented very well the other two papers of this panel. So uh, it's, a, it's actually a great thing of this entire conference, I would say. They are, like in their specificities, all the papers uh, really contribute to a very like uh, broader discourse and very effectively. 
Uh, so I also want to, to, to thank the panelists for their respect for the time limit. So we now have uh, you know, a good amount of time for questions and comments. So please. I thank you to the three speakers for your uh, brilliant presentations. Um, I just would like to ask a question pertaining to uh, terminology. Um, whether you found in the course of your research, uh, Professor Gagliotti, you said that you use citizenship and nationality as synonymous terms. So whether you, you also found cases where the two were not synonymous words. And if you have also come across terms such as Levantini, in the case of um, the Jews living in, in the North African continent. Um, yeah, um, so uh, sources uh, uses basically the word subjects and subjecthood. So, uh, and Citizens, uh, citizenship is a term that uh, pop, pops up very rarely in a certain way. Nationality is a, is a term that pops out, up very frequently. Um, but in a certain way, the terms are kind of interchangeable uh, in, 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 in the sources. But certainly subjects, subjecthood, referring to Italians, abroad and also to Italians in Italy are uh, terms that are continuously uh, continuously used. As for Levantine, uh, Levantine is a very, uh, is a problematic term, I think. Uh, this is the one, one of the reasons I don't use it because uh, Levantine is referred both to uh, Catholics and to Jews. The problem with the Jews is that it's frequently uh, used in a kind of anti-Semitic uh, way. Um, so I don't like to use this term because it's always, uh, I mean, and, and in Italian, uh, if, you, if you think at the Italian language, Levantino means someone who is uh, cheating, Honey, uh, a little bit sneaky. So it's someone who is not entirely trustable. So I mean, someone who is Levantino in Italian means always this someone is not uh, in the right. <laughs> I mean, it's not morally, um, uh, yeah, it's not, not morally trustable. So I, but, but certainly there was a community that defined itself as uh, Italo Levantine, uh, but was not necessarily a community of Jews, but was also a community of Catholics uh, going way back in time uh, in their life into the, the Ottoman Empire. Thank you. Any other question? Also, the uh, Zoom audience, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to like submit your questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much for these uh, three really fascinating papers. Um, I, I have a, a question for, for Gia and for Simona about the piccola cittadinanza. And uh, particularly for, for Gia, um, were these uh, expulsions and were there any distinction made between Italians who had the piena cittadinanza and those who had the piccola, the small citizenship? Uh, was that was that at all an issue that was discussed on some level? Uh, and for Simone, I wonder if if, if the, 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 the a piccola cittadinanza was ever sort of part of the discussion as to what Italy might be doing with the Maltese. And I, I, I suppose, for Nicola, I mean, I don't know if, if any of, of those discussions ever come up in in, in the, the the paperwork that you looked at for the colonies uh, at all. I mean, I, I doubt it, but you know. Can answer very quickly this because I, I never found uh, in my sources any instances of yeah. this distinction between uh, these are basically Italians because uh, most of them they chose after 1861 those who were already in the empire they chose to be Italians and they registered to the consulate and embassies because this was 
the only way to uh, enjoy entirely the privileges of the capitulation system. You know, so they, they had to be kind of recognized. Um, uh, the, uh, in the case of the Ottoman Empire, there, were, there was also this category of protégé. Um, and in this case, they were not uh, Italian citizens, but they were protégé by Italian citizens. Um, this was a small group, um, also because there was a, um, a new regulation, a new Ottoman regulation in 1863. So, that recognize all the former protégé as protégé. Uh, so they were, so it, basically in 1911, many of these people who were protégé before 1863, they were no longer there. And after uh, 1863, the new regulation recognized as protégé, so people who could enjoy the same privileges of the Italian citizen, all, on, only people who worked as translators and, and as dragomans within the um, structures of the consulates and embassy and, and embassy in Ottoman Empire, in the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> The answer to Roberta, my answer would be very, very brief because uh, I didn't find any uh, reference to the piccola cittadinanza. Uh, the options were, um, were just to, to keep the British uh, citizenship or to acquire the Italian metropolitan citizenship. And I will add probably uh, the, Italian, the Italian authorities, uh, they fear that uh, also some Libyans uh, could uh, or we could apply for piccola cittadinanza. So, no, my answer is no. Yeah. I, I, I might remember on, uh, on, this, uh, <coughs> on this question that uh, the legal scholar Santi Romano uh, discussed uh, the, the legal status of colonial subjects in uh, colonial Eritrea in this term as a piccola cittadinanza or something like that. But I really don't remember, but for sure he authored this Corso di Diritto Coloniale and you might find uh, references to that. But it's more like a legal discussion than uh, political, let's say, strictly from the... What's the name, Nicola, sorry? Uh, Santi Romano. Santi Romano. Yeah. Please. Uh, so thank you, I, I think all of you, I really learned a lot, and I have a question for Simona. Um, so, it's sort of a common question. Um, it's really, it's very intriguing because the story that you've told sounds so different from, at, at least, you know, what I've read from other scholars about the Maltese in Algeria, for example. So you talked about Tunisia. Um, and there, in the colonial hierarchy, the Maltese were almost at the bottom, like above the native Jews, um, in, in the bottom of the European <laughs> the non-French hierarchy, right? Um, and in part, like the explanation always given by scholars is because Maltese is a Semitic language, there was this perceived cultural linguistic proximity to um, to the Algerians, to the locals, so that they could you know, the languages were mutually intelligible. So I'm wondering, is that part of the fear um, in Libya about the potential solidarity um, that that the Maltese could have with the Libyan? And also, um, you know, I mean, it's it's just, of course, it's really important. I mean, your work is reminding us there's nothing inherent in, you know, even in the ways that colonies, colonial powers next to one another construct these hierarchies. And it's such a, your work is so important because, you know, thinking about also beyond the colonizer, um, colonized binary, I mean, throughout these colonies, but let's think about the, the Horn of Africa, I mean, Greece, Yemen, all of these different populations that are in these sort of intermediary positions. Um, but I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts about the, like the difference with Algeria, for example. Yeah, I don't know much about the Algerian context, but uh, the big difference in Libya is that the European minorities are very few. So there are very few uh, Greek and the Maltese are uh, the most, the largest community. That's why they are, uh, they are not on the bottom, uh, that's it. 
but uh, I don't have much to add because the, I haven't done any comparison yet. So it would be very, very, very interesting to 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 compare different contexts, uh, the Egypt and Algeria, and especially Tunisia. I I think. Yeah. yeah I'll just add one thing too. It seems like the story you're telling is the Maltese in Libya. Many of them have a lot of contacts with Malta itself, and at least for the story of Algeria, maybe it's more by the time you get to independence, but it seems like many of the people of Maltese origin don't have a relationship with Malta itself anymore, whereas it seems like there's a lively traffic with Malta, or for some of them. I don't know. I, I need to... I haven't studied that much yet about... because I, I couldn't find so much... Uh, archive document but uh, what I what I've seen uh, uh, regarding for example 1940 many Maltese they, they they went back to Malta so I think they kept uh, ties with uh, with Malta but uh, I, I cannot add much more actually <laughs> Thanks. I have a question for Gia uh, I would like to know if we may uh, this citizen the the idea, the stereotype of Balkanism, no? the Todorova idea that Balkanism is something that is linked to the um, cultural expert of these uh, countries, uh, but also ethnic and race expert, and uh, remain uh, this difference between the Italians and the Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I cannot uh, really answer your, your question, which is uh, an interesting question. But uh, according to the, the sources I, I uh, saw, uh, I've seen until, until now, I, I, I don't find this, this kind of uh, issues and differences about this population. This, this are, uh, also because si since... Um, since these people, since these Italians who arrived to Italy because they were ex uh and because they were used as a tool of propaganda by the Italian government and by the Giuletti government, um, they were all recast as truly Italians, independently of the fact that they had also sometimes names that had nothing to do with um, uh, with uh, the, the Italian language or independently from the fact that they um, had no relationships and families and relatives um, in Italy. They ended up all in um, makeshift refuge uh, or refuges or they, uh, they were kind of, a, a large campaign was launched on the newspapers to collect money, to uh, find housing for for, for for these people. So uh, the, the the government insisted, and all the public opinion, the, na the nationalistic public opinion, insisted a lot about the Italianness, the truly Italianness of these people. But the this truly Italianness disappeared months after when all these people started to uh, claim things, I mean, claim, I mean, okay, we are citizens, we are Italian citizens, so now the Italian government has to give us back something. We, we've been loyal, uh, we came to Italy, we have been expelled, we, we lost everything we had, we lost family, we lost uh, houses, we lost jobs, we lost uh, assets, and so on and so forth. So now, please, pay us back for what we have suffered. What, um, so there was, uh, only at this point, there was this attempt to kind of distinguish, divide, and so if you look at the sources uh, um, in, the, in 1913, 1914, when all these um, things continued, uh, there, there are attempts by consuls uh, in, 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 in the Ottoman Empire to explain that these people were not truly, they were not all truly Italians. There were also some Italians who uh, had taken 
the, 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 the Ottoman citizen, uh, citizenship, they tried to come back to Italian citizenship, saying, okay, I was forced to... to and at this point, they are not, they are not any longer uh, considered as trustable people. So there are a lot of, I mean, um, uh, documents that say that these people are not completely uh, true to, I mean, Italy and loyal and people that uh, uh, consulate and Italy has to, uh, I mean, uh, take into account as loyal Italian citizen. And, but, but the problem is that then there was the war, another war, <laughs> and with this other war, uh, <coughs> Italians became again, the Italians who came back to the Ottoman Empire, they became again enemy aliens, and, and things started again to kind of mix up. And, yeah. Well. Yeah, just a couple of considerations. Uh, it worked so well, uh, the panel together, these three uh, papers. I was wondering about, uh, because on the one side they show, right, we talked about um, the contingency of citizenship, but there are limits to the contingency, uh, right, that are, have to do with race, to a large extent, right? And then the other consideration is there about, is there about the uh, question of post-colonial the um, attitudes towards people uh, sort of demanding citizenship in the post-colonial period. And uh, Nicola, you made a, a connection with migrants today. And I was thinking about this, the idea that acquiring Italian citizenship is an honor, right? Which is then, and today the discourse of the right, of the nativist right, which also is sort of framing right, citizenship as a privilege that you have to right. Uh, acquire and you have to show that you are entitled to that, not just uh, right, any person. And that's also uh, has to do with race again. So, so I was thinking about the consideration that Melino makes in that book, Cittadinanza e Postcoloniale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's more a comment yeah. than a question. Yeah, no. Uh, thanks, of course. I mean, I remember when I saw this picture, thank you, when I saw this picture, in August 2017, it really impressed me so much because it was so clear to, re po to it was so possible to recognize people from the Horn of Africa. For those who are familiar with Horn of Africa, or so I've been, I've been there, or somehow, uh, it was just like uh, it was like a picture from the past, but with new clothes. And this is the this protest they made uh, uh, in Rome uh, was really basically a, a material, I mean, I think of your presentation as a, a space of citizenship, a space in which citizenship was contested, was, uh, was, was uh, fought for, so uh, very, very clearly. And, the, the la and in the language of the sources, the, the, the concept of the merit of the, is always, always pop up. Uh, but not only in the Italian case, I have to say. Also, I mean, I mean recently I was reading again the book by Emmanuel Saade on, on French. It is exactly the same. So you need to deserve, uh, you need to prove that you deserve the citizenship to, be, to become uh, to be like, like us, basically. So, uh, fully, uh, I mean, it, it, we should elaborate more also this continuity, but eventually also not only on the let's say, uh, theoretical or, but really also in the policies, in eventually in the, in the practices, um, in, the, in the whole history eventually, and what remains of this. So because probably very much of this written, of what is written on post-colonial citizenship is, is, uh, comes from the, I mean, social sciences or uh, political theory, which is very interesting, but probably from the historical perspective, we should also really look at continuities, I would say. Oh, yeah. that, uh, do you <laughs> Thank you to all the, the panelists. And this question, I guess, is for everybody, but also, Nicola, because you were focusing on um, this case of, of Senegal, which is very interesting. And um, it brought to mind, of course, the idea of of Ascari for me, I mean, one who were the, the 
soldiers who were either conscripted or signed up uh, to fight, um, particularly in Libya and then later in Ethiopia. And I think you know, the, there are upwards of 150,000 Oscaris who went to, to fight. And I was curious if any of you have found any sources. Were there ever any like, debates or discussions around citizenship you know, in, in, in response to the service, the military service or, or anything like that? Yes, that, there was. There was in especially I think that uh, especially when after the the, the, the campaign in Libya, uh, one a big group of uh, Libyans were brought to Italy to show the, the basically the country for which they had fought. Uh, there was a huge discussion also in public in public opinion about this. We if they fought. Uh, I mean the same as in French. Basically, we need to give. We we could give grant and finally Italian citizenship, but it, it of course the the the, this, the debate uh, like finished very soon and was just con uh, circumscript in the in the in the in the metropole. Never really like arrived in there. But on the other hand, the Oscaris for the families always always. Uh, Fought really for the recognition, for the acknowledgement of uh, having fought, and even when I happened to talk to, uh, I think, a son of a farmer Askari, he remembered that his father had never received a pension from the Italian state. Although, so basically, his um, he, that he should have earned, uh, he deserved a, a pension from the Italian state because he had fought. And uh, so it was still bitter that the father didn't uh, get this, uh, this, yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's time for us to move outside and enjoy coffee break before you know, the next panel. So thank you again to all the panelists. <laughs> Thank you.